Again, I'm Gabriella Lettini, the academic dean at Esther King, and it is my distinct pleasure to uh, moderate our panel discussion with, for this afternoon, Visions of a Just Future in Science Fiction. And um, of course, for everyone that was as, at the earlier program, our mind is full of the wonderful lectures and uh, questions and, 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 and thoughts generated by uh, Dr. Sylvester Johnson. Um, it is my great pleasure to introduce to you, uh, many of you already know all of these people, but to formally introduce to you three of the most uh, generative thinker, interdisciplinary writer, wonderful person that I, I have the pleasure to know in real life. And we have here, starting from our guest from outside Star King, Dr. Monica Coleman, that is a Professor of Africana Studies at the University of Delaware. Welcome, thank you so much for being with us. Uh, then we have Professor Aiza Jama Everett, who is teaching at Star King um, and is a prolific writer and an activist. And then our wonderful professor, Dr. Son Power Farzane, that is Assistant Professor of Islamic and Digital Media Studies. So it's a wonderful combination of people. I will try to speak as little as possible so that they can organically de develop their conversation. We had agreed on basically five questions, so we'll just try to move us slightly along. Um, and that will, will be after the panel presentation, there will be plenty of time for discussion, thinking in integrative learning in the small groups. So um, um, my first question is um, to please introduce um, a little bit yourself and your work uh, to the community. And later, the second question, I, I will repeat, it will be to more specifically speak about your science fiction work or your scholarship on science fiction. But the first round is just for you, uh, instead of me of reading all your wonder, the wonderful things you have been doing, to tell us more in your own words about uh, who you are and what you have been doing. And let's start with our special guest, um, Dr. Monica Coleman. Thank you. Well, I'm the special guest. <laughs> um, I think it's good afternoon to both of us. And I am, I guess I'll tell you more about some of my work in the next question, but I uh, identify myself as a philosophical theologian who works with liberationist goals uh, out of womanist traditions and was a process theological metaphysic. I am currently professor of Africana studies at the University of Delaware. So I also do work on black religions and religious pluralism. And some of you may know my work in the the intersection of mental health and faith. Um, but I have a love of Black women science fiction, and I'll talk about how I've done some work on that and where that's led me during the last couple of years when we get to that question. Thank you so much. Um, Professor Ayuzi Jama Everett. Hey, everybody. Um, so honored to be here. Um, <clears throat> whenever I introduce myself, it's funny, I always start with Star King. Um, I am a Star King graduate, um, my first and best degree, as I say, um, in part because it allowed me to do a lot of the work that um, I was already interested in, in part with um, African traditional religions, in part with working with uh, folks working with substance use, um, and in part um, dealing with the fantastic and the, uh, and the imaginative. Um, for the purposes of this talk, I'm, uh, I think I have, I have three, no, I have four books out right now um, through Small Beer Press and um, Rosarian Press that focus on alternative notions of what it means to be human via um, lots of different processes. But um, I didn't really consider myself an Afrofuturist despite being in that group and being on the list server for Afrofuturism, for those of you that can remember that far back. Um, while I was at Star King, in fact, um, I didn't consider myself um, an Afrofuturist because I didn't write about the future until um, my most recent graphic novel, which is coming out this year, 
which is an African retelling of the Count of Monte Cristo. Um, so that's just a little bit about me and um, I'll tell more later. Oh, thank you. Great news about the new book. And Dr. Sampara Frazzane, welcome. Thank you, Dr. Latini, and thank you everyone uh, on the panel as well as everyone attending. I'm so excited to be here for this uh, specific panel discussion as it's near and dear to my heart and work. Uh, as uh, Dean Latini mentioned, I'm uh, the Assistant Professor of Islamic and Digital Media Studies at our school. Most of you are already familiar with, uh, with me and we've already met and had classes together, but uh, you may not know that I moonlight as a game designer and a novelist. Uh, and for many years I've, uh, um, been working on developing a, um, a small independent game studio called Nightpath Publishing. I'll um, share my screen later and show some of the, the products that we work on, but the general gist is uh, science fiction, cyberpunk, and fantasy, uh, both fiction in terms of novels and stories, as well as um, role-playing games and card games, uh, um, many of which have some sort of social justice bent um, and specifically this thread of what I call secondary narratives where the, the, like the, the flagship game that we have is called Entromancy. It's a cyberpunk fantasy, um, sort of like dystopian uh, um, uh, role-playing game. If you think of like Dungeons and Dragons meets The Matrix uh, set in 2076 San Francisco and it's fun and it's action-packed and there's a novel series and all this like fun stuff. But uh, there's an undercurrent of uh, uh, second-class citizenship and what does it mean to have people of different races um, uh, that uh, experience second-class citizenship and all this stuff about race and gender and so on and so forth um, that uh, serve as a backdrop. So even though you might be experiencing uh, a fun game or um, uh, an action-packed novel series, it's meant to expose the reader or the, the game or the player to um, more serious uh, cultural narratives that we can um, that hopefully make us stop and think and and um, and uh, and affect social change in the long run. Well, thank you, everyone. Um, the second question is to speak uh, more specifically, maybe as a continuation of your introduction about either your work um, in science fiction or your scholarship. And from now on, I really invite you to come in and out. There are just three of us in uh, three of you in dialogue so feel free uh you know to trust how this develops organically i will just move you along with a question when I, I i see that we need maybe to take a turn but whoever wants to start to tell us more about your scholarship or your work of fiction who wants to go i'll start oh okay. no no, I'll let the guests go, please. <laughs> no, you you first. I'm talking about scholarship. It probably the kind of things you're writing. So, <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, I'll um, maybe I'll do a little merge, right? Um, because um, you know, of course, my actually my first black uh, sci-fi author was Samuel Delaney, um, and he was a, a black queer man from um, Harlem, and I am um, a black man who has extended queer family from Harlem. So um, that was like my first, like rah, right? But my second, um, I say the author that I studied the most was Octavia Butler. And I'll say I, I studied Octavia Butler before she was cool. Um, I'll say like, you know, like back in the 80s and the 90s where, and, and it was interesting, you know, the people, when I went to see her, it was always a lot of black women and it was really a lot of black queer women. Um, who were showing up for those readings. And it wasn't a lot of other people talking about her. Um, and one of the things that really fascinated me with her, and of course I went and I saw her and I was humble and stupid and dumb all at the same time. And I asked her how she got her ideas about science fiction. And she says, she says, I don't have ideas about science fiction. She's like, I have ideas about science and then I write fiction. She said, the thing to do is you open up the New York Times and they have a science section and you read it and you understand the science. And then from there, you craft narrative around what would happen if you expand that science out or reduce that science. And so one of the really interesting things with me with Octavia Butler, and I've definitely taken this as part of my work is that if you read her stuff, there's some spaceships there, right? There's some spaceships and there's some lasers in it. By and large, it's not about that. By and large, it's a lot about biology. It's a lot about human interaction. It's a lot about what more what we would call like soft sciences or human interaction, 
Um, and, and the technology is more about biotechnology. Um, the work that I'm doing now is a lot around the interaction between um, people's mind states and substances that they take in, whether that be um, illegal uh, substances or um, taken in the context of traditional um, cultures and, and traditions in terms of ayahuasca or, or psilocybin or even MDMA um, to those degrees. Those are all technologies, right? Yeast is a technology that we have domesticated in order to do some really interesting and exciting things. Um, new research is looking at um, utilizing yeast to make psilocybin and to make some of DMT and some of these other compounds that people are taking. So my merge sort of looks at what's the bioethics of um, changing who we are as human beings, because I think that's what technology ultimately does. It influences what we consider the human, as our, as our keynote was saying earlier. Well, it's a great segue. <laughs> um, I'm going to talk a bit about my work, and then I guess I'll go a little into Octavia Butler as well, so we have a sense of who we're referring to and why she's so cool. Um, I began the academic study of Black women science fiction over 20 years ago in the early 2000s. And I said the academic study because I was just reading it for fun um, because I didn't, I was told, oh, you should try science fiction. And I read Ray Bradbury and was like, oh, kill me now, right? And I read Isaac Asimov, I was like, this is supposed to be something I would like. And then I realized, oh, I didn't like those who were two of the most popular science fiction writers in the 80s, 90s, let's say it really was 80s, um, that I was reading this. And then I said, oh, how, try Octavia Butler. And I was like, oh, when Black women put their hands on this, it comes out different. And in a way I find particularly compelling. Um, now, I love Black women's literature in general, and so I was a sort of fan of Octavia Butler, Tanana Reeve Du, and Nilo Hopkinson in particular, and thinking of the 90s, early 2000s, and I was and am interested in how Black women's science fiction, um, which now we generally refer to um, as Afrofuturist work, although we can get to genre designations later, <laughs> um, how it invoked religion how they nearly always invoked religion in general and black religion in particular, sometimes through critique, sometimes by affirmation, but always creatively and with a strong emphasis on the role and power of ancestors and quite often African ancestors. These works have long been dystopic, hopeful, time collapsing and theological. So I've published articles about black religions, religious hybridity, and constructive theology in Nalo Hopkins' Brown Girl on the Ring and in Tanana Reeve Dew's The Living Blood, but I've been pretty committed to the work of Octavia Butler. For the last 15 years, <clears throat> I've taught her book Parable of the Sower as a model of constructive theology, contextual theology, and process theology. And in March of 2020, I texted my friend, Afrofuturist and horror writer Tanana Reeve Dew and said, hey, the world is looking a lot like Parable of the Sower. You wanna talk about it? And we thought we'd host a Zoom with about 100, 200 people on the line and thousands of people registered for it, which not only gave us a tech problem we had to solve very quickly, um, but since that time, we've hosted nearly 24 webinars on the topic Octavia tried to tell us, parable for today's pandemic, to over 8,000 unique registrants and the first webinar receiving over 14,000 views on YouTube and earning us a grant from Columbia University's Center on African-American Religion, Sexual Politics, and Social Justice. We've talked with other science fiction writers, Butler's agent, screen actors, musicians, activists, scholars, and teachers of Butler's work about how Butler gives us tools for living in a global pandemic. So if you're not familiar, who is Octavia Butler? I'm glad you asked. Um, this is my short, short description of her. Uh, she is seen as kind of the godmother of Black women science fiction, um, speculative fiction, and Afrofuturist writings. Along with Samuel Delaney, she, two of them are really seen as kind of the big entrees into Black people's, right, 20th century Black people's work on science fiction. She is the author of 13 books, numerous short stories, including the novel Kindred, which is often taught in public schools at the middle school level. She's won numerous Hugo and Nebula Science Fiction Awards and the MacArthur Genius Award. Two of her books have been adap adapted into graphic novels and four books are under contract for adaptation to screen. And in 2020, nearly 15 years after her death, Parable the Sower made the New York Times bestseller list, which was the first time any of her books were a New York Times bestseller. So she was kind of this cult classic really <laughs> until quite much more recently. 
Um, and if you want, I can talk more about what Parable of the Sower does in particular. Um, now I can do when we talk about the next question in terms of why I invoke that novel in particular. So fascinating. Thank you both. And um, I echo what's been said uh, specifically about the idea that science fiction stories don't necessarily have to talk about science. Um, in my own experience, I'm going to share my screen for just a moment. Um, in my own experience, uh, this is the, the Nightpath publishing page where we, I'm just going to show you a couple of the different things that we're working on. Um, when, we, when we think about games and when we think about um, uh, narratives that occur within games and also uh, novels in science fiction or you know my genre is cyberpunk and fantasy, urban fantasy, we're being transported to elsewhere, maybe for the game session or the time that we're reading, but we really have the opportunity to examine what's happening right now. And in Entromancy, which is the uh, novel tr trilogy and card game and uh, a role-playing game that's set, uh, you know, 50 years from now after the, um, there's been another world war and um, this, I'm actually just gonna read the, um, the synopsis uh, on the, the back of the book so you have an idea about what the series is about and the setting. Um, we're transported to a different time, but the story and the narrative really is about what we're experiencing right now because second, second class citizenship isn't happening you know, 50 years from now, I mean, we can, hope, we can hope that it doesn't happen 50 years from now, but we know that it continues, but it's really happening right now. And it's, and um, science, I believe that science fiction and fantasy and cyberpunk and any sort of like fiction genre has the opportunity to tell stories about right now. And if it's not doing that, we need to look at it with a critical lens and see what types of stereotypes uh, may it be reinforcing that are problematic. Lord of the Rings, for example, in terms of fantasy is one of my favorite um, uh, births of a specific genre. And it's super problematic if we look at who the bad people are, who the enemies are, what they look like, how they're a faceless enemy, how they're all uh, brown and black skinned uh, orcs and um, uh, um, Urukai and all of these different um, characters. It's really problematic. And so even if we're, we're not using it for, um, for critical analysis, we have to lend that critical lens to science fiction and fantasy. And so um, Entromancy, I'm just going to read this briefly, says that 2076 is not a good year to be a special agent. A quarter of the world's power runs on ceridium, a newly discovered element that has had the unintended consequence of spawning a new race of people and several forms of magic that were once thought to have been forgotten. Iskander Aridosi is an agent of night, a paramilitary force created to contain and control this new perceived threat, but he soon learns that not all within its organization is as it seems. A botched, a botched mission turns out to be the least of his troubles when he un unearths a plot that threatens the uneasy truce between the oryx and humans of San Francisco and centers on a form of magic that toys with the very fabric of the universe, entromancy. And so this, is a, this started out as a novel series and it turned, out and turned into a game. And as we were doing this, we had to think through, for example, if there are issues of second class citizenship between humans and what are called the under races or, or um, pejoratively uh, the non-humans um, that appear. Um, how do we play that out at a game table where it's like, are we empowering people to uh, um, in, in effect enact out these, uh, act out these stereotypes at a game table? Like that doesn't feel right. So those are some of the issues that we had to deal with transporting this uh, novel series into a game and then uh, an audiobook and so on and so forth. And one other of these uh, titles that we have been developing is called Kodi Sattvas, uh, which is a play on uh, computer programming like coding and also the word Bodhisattva, which is a, um, a Buddhist term for someone who holds themselves back from enlightenment so that they can be to the benefit of all, of all beings. Um, and uh, in this uh, game, which is not related to entromancy, but it has similar themes in terms of the technology, it's a, um, we call it an eco-hacking collaborative one-page role-playing game where uh, it's easy, uh, you can just download it for free and sit around the table and you know, play with your friends, either digitally or in person. And essentially in this game, you're an ethical hacker attempting to liberate natural ecosystems under the influence of the simulated autocracy of metaphysical serialization and automated registration authority, which those of you who have studied Buddhism at all will recognize the word samsara as being the world in which we live right now. 
By deploying the appropriate programs, you might be able to restore balance to the natural world, but you won't be able to do it alone. So it's a it's a collaborative, um, like I said, one page role playing game where um, it's like you know Dungeons and Dragons with Buddhist themes, and the idea be behind this, as well as Antiromancy and and uh, some of our other games and novels, is to empower players and readers to have fun doing something, but also think critically about what they're doing while they're doing it and be exposed to some issues that they may not think about in their daily lives because they don't have another opportunity to encounter them. Thank you all. And continuing this conversation, can you tell us more about the roles that technology plays in these science fiction stories or games or scholarship? And how are, are its benefits and its peers portrayed? Um, if, I would love to kind of jump off on where um, I can't, I don't know how to pronounce your first name. I, I use it. Perfect. I, uh, great. Um, where you mentioned about kind of what, what technology might look like when um, Black people put their hands on science fiction and how I think it looks a little different as well. And I'd love to hear what you do with it because I, I suspect it's similar to the things I'm thinking about Octavia Butler. Uh, I want to talk a little bit about Parable to Sower since that's what I've been talking about for the last couple of years um, online. And in this book, if you haven't read it, run out, get it, grab it, really, it's great. 15-year-old um, African-American protagonist Lauren Oya Olamina and her family live in one of the only safe neighborhoods that are on, it's kind of in a suburb of Los Angeles. Behind the walls of their defended enclave, Lauren's father, who is a preacher, a Baptist preacher, and a handful of other citizens try to salvage what remains of a culture that's been destroyed by drugs, disease, war, chronic water shortages, uh, bad politics, etc. And while her father tries to lead people on the righteous path, Lauren struggles with hyper empathy. It's a condition that makes her extraordinarily sensitive to the pain and the pleasure of others. When fire destroys their compound, Lauren's family is killed and she is forced out into a world that is fraught with danger. With a handful of other refugees, Lauren makes her way north to safety, forming community and conceiving of a revolutionary theology or philosophy, depending on what you want to call it, named Earthseed along the way. And I think when it comes to technology, there's a verse of Earthsea that I find very helpful, which says simply adapt or die. And I think this is a common theme for, um, for Butler and for many science fiction writers. And this theme where you kind of, sometimes you do see advanced technology, right? You're, there seems where you have like aliens crossbreeding with humanity, like in the Genesis trilogy, or even the parable series where the protagonist, Lauren, describes the destiny as being in the stars. And she's not being metaphorical. She actually means space travel and the development of new worlds and societies as being the appropriate or really the only hope for humanity. So that is, there's a strong sense that humanity has, can, and will destroy this earth and or each other. And a future is found partly in carving new ways of being community and new ways of being human, but also in new ways and in new places to live. Um, I also find it notable that in much of Afrofuturist literature, invoking technology does not preclude the involvement of an ancestral or religious past in helping to guide people into the future. And so that's something I think is really fun and would love to chat with y'all about more. Yeah, I think um, one of my big pushes and, and sort of looking, looking and writing um, about science fiction is to liberate science, right? And right now, like our notions of science are very connected to academia. Um, and so they're um, connected to power. Um, they're connected to exclusivity. Um, they're connected to exclusion, right? Um, only recently in sort of doing some of my other work, I have uh, come into contact with and been exposed to examples of citizen scientists, right? People that are not engaged in, um, you know, not employed by an academic institution, not going for a PhD, not going around me or whatever. And so they get to actually explore scientific endeavors that, you know, may not make money, <laughs> right? Well, what happens then, right? What happens if we start breeding grasses that people can utilize to heal themselves? right? And we spread those seeds generally, openly, right? Um, what happens if we start developing 
um, foods that um, require less water on this planet. What would happen if, you know, and this is, you know, I've, I've, this is a science fiction story that I've been threatening to write for like decades and I never will, I probably will at some point. But what happens if, um, what happens if a Filipino child in Manila creates the first rail gun? The rail gun is a, it's, it's a science fiction idea. It's, it's, it's physically, it's possible. Basically, you're propelling matter um, forward using magnets and not um, any sort of explosive device, right? It would be a radical change in, in weapon design, right? It's, it's, a, it's a standard in all big science fiction uh, uh, space operas, right? Well, what if it's not the rich that developed this technology first? What happens then? So often we connect technology with access to power. And I think really interesting technological inventions come from decolonized spaces. My joke is that like our space, um, our futures have already been colonized. If you look at Star Wars, right? This is the imagination of a, a rich white dude from Marin. No offense, I love Star Wars, right? But I'm really interested in the future of a Ugandan mother with HIV. I'm really interested about what she thinks the world is gonna look like 100, 200, 500, 1,000 years from now. Those are the futures that I think are more probable, more accessible, and more able to do, to do work now. Remember, Octavia Butler was not writing for Embrace of Privilege. I'm so glad you know Tanana Reeve. We're like half friends, like she knows who I am. I love her to death, right? Tell her I say hi. She was not writing for Embrace of Privilege, right? Um, Nalo Hopkinson, really good friend of mine, right? Love her to death, right? Trust me, the majority of her career, she was not writing from a place of privilege, right? And yet those are some of the most exciting, interesting and innovating works that are out there. So how do we liberate this notion of the future from the rich, from the powerful? How do we empower those who don't have now to have, to imagine interesting interesting futures that like incorporate things that that we don't usually think about i'll say for me like a uh, uh, sci-fi classic for me is dune frank herbert's uh, novel frank herbert did a lot of different things before he was a writer or as he was a writer one of the most fascinating concepts in dune for me is the notion of the still suit and briefly in dune the whole planet is a desert and the people that have lived that live on the desert have created these, um, these clothes that they wear um, that recycle all of their body moisture and is powered by their own locomotion, right? And there is an efficiency in that that I don't see in the Star Wars Millennium Falcon, which is this huge ship that can go faster than light and only has four people on it. What is that? Right. So like when you see like the, the assumptions that we have now that we're projecting into the future, I think there are ways in which class, power, all those things are getting projected as well. So I'm really more interested in seeing how people who don't have a lot now, what their what the economy and the efficiency of their future visioning is, because the reality of the situation is if we are on this planet, we're going to have to be a lot more efficient. There is so much here. <laughs> I'm I'm just trying to think about how to how to process everything that's being said and also offer something that that maybe um, leans into some of the different aspects that we're we're touching on. Two things are coming to to me. One is like the actual representation of diversity within science fiction and fantasy, and the, the second is more theoretical about game design and development. The first one being so in terms of actual representation, what. What I'd love to happen is for us collectively to move towards critical thinking about representation in science fiction and fantasy. Uh, I mentioned Lord of the Rings. Dune is another great example uh, in that uh, because of the movie coming out, there are so many um, uh, new op-eds and pieces about the, Oriental, the Orientalism of Dune and the way in which um, things have been borrowed uh, from the Islamic tradition and uh, conveyed in a way that is... Um, touches on Orientalist themes. I highly recommend looking into that for anyone who's interested. One of my students in, in our Intro to Islam class this past semester actually wrote a, a wonderful paper on that. Um, and 
pursuant to that, um, uh, I'm obviously a big sci-fi buff and someone, uh, more than one person has recommended the show, The Expanse, which is, which is on uh, Amazon Prime. Um, you know, if you're into Star Trek or uh, uh, Battlestar Galactica, like that's the, that's the next coming of, of, uh, of these types of shows, uh, space operas. And I've watched like half of the, uh, we have a newborn at home. So like, I, I, I'm only able to see like 10 minutes of a show at a time if that. So I've watched like half of the first episode and the lack of diversity in the, in terms of representation, in terms of the, the actors that are on screen in the first 30 minutes or whatever is palpable uh, for someone who's looking for that. And the, the, the idea that, that, um, uh, Star Wars as well as a, um, as a story of whiteness um, in terms of the, the, um, the main trilogies. Um, that not only does that trend need to be changed, but the, the, um, the trend existing in the first place needs to be challenged and to be looked at and to be examined to see that um, uh, children who uh, do not identify as um, as white or do not look white or maybe pass as white, but what are their experiences uh, growing up and seeing this as their representation of like me growing up as a kid watching Aladdin and thinking that that's, that's uh, what Middle Eastern-ness is like or what it means to be Middle Eastern-ish um, and, and having to unpack that later as an adult and studying Orientalism and, di and discovering that like, wow, this is a really problematic um, uh, thing for children and, and others to see. In more the in the theoretical context, I just want to touch on Dr. Um, Sylvester's uh, um, piece, which I thought was just brilliantly composed uh, this morning in the keynote. Um, in terms of game design and development, there is a uh, there is a discussion in game studies about um, the the balance between what's called narratology and ludology. Narratology being the development uh, or the study of narratives. Uh, within story making uh, versus ludology, which is actually the game playing. Um, so if you're playing a game, many of you uh, um, are probably gamers. And if you're not, you might not know that lots of these games have these sweeping narratives and epics that are just as in depth as uh, you know a Star Wars or Star Trek or Lord of the Rings. The difference is that you're able to embody a character in doing these things. And so it's a very different thing to read about something passively than to make the choice yourself to send the person off to execution or to save the um, save the deer versus you know um, uh, letting the oil spill happen or, or whatever choices are are offered you that's that's the ludology component it's kind of a false binary because they go hand in hand and Dr Johnson's talk reminded me of a video game series called Deus Ex which is very popular and um, uh, is set in the future and is a it is very much about um, what does it mean to have people who are augmented by different uh, prosthetics and are uh, biased against or discriminated against and they're uh, because of people who are have a more fundamentalist attitude about what it means to be human and are against that type of augmentation and they're you know pejoratively call people who have a prosthetic arm an og or an Augie or something like that. I don't remember what it, what it, what it is. Um, and for me, there is a pivot em, em, um, emboldened by technology in terms of uh, video games where someone is able to embody that act of either aggressing against someone who is augmented or um, perceived as not being fully human, or they're able to support uh, the ability for someone to get a prosthetic arm or leg or, or what have you in these games. And, and uh, the uh, Deus Ex games, you know, like them or hate them, they do seek to uh, tap into or lean into this idea that you have to embody your decision-making vis-a-vis uh, uh, um, physical augmentation, uh, similar to what we, we heard about in Dr. Johnson's talk. Fascinating stuff. I got to push back real quick on the expanse. I'm sorry. Um, just because one, um, always read the book. Uh, I would say James A. Corey, two um, authors, very interesting. Um, expanse does a really good job looking at issues of class. Um, um, it, you know, the, not, and not just in terms of the proletariat, but in terms of a different language 
a different culture, um, a different body. And um, if you saw the first, you know, 15, 20 minutes, well, what does it mean if someone doesn't grow up in Earth's gravity, right? Well, what that means is that when they come on Earth's gravity, they're actually being crushed because they grew up, um, they grew up on, on artificial gravity. So the, the, are they still human, right? This is still that, that talk. And um, I just, I feel like the Expanse is a really good job talking about, and in fact, the, this latest season is pretty much um, a galactic class war that's going on. So I, I just got to push back that much on that. Regarding your point around publishing, I mean, I always have to say this as a, you know, person who self-published his first novel, was fortunate enough to have it picked up by um, a small press and has, you know, been doing other stuff and, you know, just possibly have an offer from a, from a major company to adapt one of my books. Um, publishing is just racist. And like, we can have whatever conversations that we wanna have about it. And we can, like, when you see the numbers of how many editors are people of color or women, when you look at the numbers of like, how many, like how many books are put out there, like for people, like, it's just racist. It's not, a, to me at least, as someone actively in this process, it's not really a dialogue, right? There, there's lip service. Right, but what publishers do by and large is they pick their one or two. They pick their one or two queer people, they pick their one or two black people, they took their one or two whatevers and they say, okay, these are the ones that we're going for. And whenever you do that, what you're doing is saying, these are the exceptionals and everyone else can be humdrum, but we're still gonna publish them, right? So it's, we're not, it's, it's not, it's not equitable. It's 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 like it's it's just a division based off of race, class, sexual orientation, or whatever, right? That's just racist, right? And we can move forward in that, right? Once we know that a process is racist, people can decide whether or not they wish to not be racist, <laughs> right? And how that goes, or they can say no, we commit to the system of race oppression and continue, and we're fine, right? I like I think when we try and complicate things that aren't complicated, what ends up happening is that the people that are stuck in that system start internalizing some of that, that mishigash, for lack of a better term, and thinking, oh, it's, it's me, right? Like my, like my quality isn't good enough. Um, I know uh, uh, Dr. Coleman has seen um, the letters that um, Octavia Butler wrote to herself in terms of getting published, that she had to be her own cheering section she had to tell herself, hey, look, I'm going to do this. There is nobody else. I've, you know, my third degree as an um, MFA student, right? Black sci-fi, people were like, oh, Octavia Butler. I'm like, yeah, name two other people. I was fortunate enough to be in a program with Octavia, with uh, Nalo Hopkinson. And so people were aware of her. But by and large, if I'd gone to any other MFA program, Black sci-fi, they're like, eh, just, where's the support for that, right? Where's support for where's the support for people of color writing narratives that aren't just about suffering, right? I have a commitment in my writing. Like I say, I'm not interested in in misery porn, right? And I know people who've written that misery porn stuff who who confess to it now, and they were like, I wrote this because that was the only way I could get published. And I think this goes back to Octavia Butler. One of the things I think unconsciously I picked up from her. Um, and I, and I think this is, this is a theme that I've seen, and maybe that maybe I'm wrong. In it. But one of the things I think she does really well is find fascinating ways to show how people can build together, right? And whether that be across a human alien connection, through time from <laughs> racist ancestors to like you know current folks to people who have you know what might be considered mental illness. Right, like building together, right? Like Octavia Butler, was, her work is really strong in finding these connections that are not typically seen. We're not getting together to fight a dragon. We're not getting together to like banish the evil empire. We're getting together to survive. And I think she's really good at that. And that's something that I hope to um, replicate in, in a lot of my work. I mean, completely ditto, right? And I mean, and I would argue it's not just Octavia Butler, but other Black science fiction writers, right? And 
of course there are more than two um many of them but i mean it's, it's like being it's like being in the film industry right like people pick their favorites and they want to show certain kinds of things but people have been writing as we know even if they're selling it out the trunk right of their of their cars and i mean really i was going to say something very similar about where butler comes in humanity can i go to the humanity question um in um because it always involves community right and i think that's um, always going to be something that's really important. And I wanted to talk a bit about why her work seemed so prophetic, in part because um, one of the themes she talks about is not only survival, but what it is we have to survive, right? We're surviving like all the ways we destroyed the climate, but also all the ways we've destroyed each other. So she talks about this book is written I and mean, it's published in 1990, right? Parable of the Sower, um, clearly written in the 80s. And she's like, oh, there's going to be this fascist presidential candidate with the theme, Make America Great Again. I mean, so you read it, you're like, what? Right? I mean, I've been reading it for so long. And I was like, this is really familiar about this thing when it came in real life. And I was like, how did she catch it? Well, because in some ways it was foreseeable, like left to our own devices, this is where we're going to go. And she's talking about the predicting American fascism, the return of slavery, the gap between the rich and the poor, the scarcity of needed resources like clean air and clean water, right? And some of the technologies that she picks up, particularly in Parable of the Sower, are things that don't, oh, you might not identify naturally as technology, right? So she actually uses um, Lauren's disabling condition as a kind of technology, right? Her, what it could be seen as a weakness of feeling and, you know, hyper empathy, feeling what other people feel, right? And mainly pain, there's so much pain, but she gets pleasure too, right? So it goes to, it cuts both ways. Um, that could be seen as a disabling condition. And yet Butler makes it into a technology. Like this is how she connects with people. This is how she networks. This is how she forms community, right? It's this ability to actually understand deeply how others are feeling. Right, um, making acorn bread is technology <laughs> and parable the sower. And so, if you're looking for like gadgets, you're not going to find them. But how do you use what's in front of you? And there are people out here make. I mean, you can actually get recipes online for acorn bread. You can grind up your acorns, right? Um, but saying, how do you take what's right here and live off of that? Something that you would normally overlook, something you normally kick to the curb, right? Um, something you would never think of as this is going to be edible, right? And saying, this is going to be our staple now. And I, I figured this out. And ritual also becomes a technology for Butler, which I think is also important in community. And I'll talk more about when we get to our new normal, right? But being able to have community rituals actually becomes a technology for Butler in terms of how we form community, how we stay in community, right? Um, how we, when we're falling apart, how we try to come together. And so I think that Butler has a lot of hope, right? And I think many other Black science fiction writers have a lot of hope in humanity, um, that humanity in and with community and often drawing on ancestral power, sometimes it's more explicit, sometimes it's more elemental, um, can creatively transform the world. Um, but it's in, in a kind of with generosity, with inclusion and with a commitment to healing others. But it's also very clear that the same humanity can screw it all up, right? <laughs> and so that the same humanity has kind of screwed it all up. And it involves digging deeper into what it means to be human and to reconsider which parts of humanity we're holding on to and which parts of humanity we wanna uplift in order to find what you might say is the best or the core of being human and how that helps us to live into the future. Great. Uh, uh, Dr. Monica started us, you know, led us already to the question about human identity and the exercise of power. Anything more from, the other panelists before then we have the, the, the final question about uh, the new normal. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I, just a reminder, right, that like that term human is so specious, right? Like it is so fragile that 200 years ago in this country, well, nah, say 95 years in this country, like, would Dr. Williams or myself be considered human, right? If I'm three-fifths of a man, am I 
human, right? And what is like that category, like what is it equal and why is that so important, right? It is that that, that, is, the, um, that is the prime unit, right? That human is, is what counts, right? So like, well, are you, if it's not human, that it doesn't have rights, unless you're a corporation, right? And, it, and it's, an, it's an interesting like thought process to think about in the US, right? That we will give these, non, these non-corporal entities legal rights in this country. And yet things that have bodies, that have emotion, that have motivation, that can form connections, that can form its own units, that can communicate with other human beings, that can communicate with human beings are not considered worthy of legal status. So I wonder, you know, and, and again, Octavia Butler does this with the uh, Xenogenesis series, you know, is human the marker, right? Is that the marker that we should be paying attention to? You know, consciousness may be subjective, but I feel like if something can argue for its own consciousness, that's a good start, right? Does conscious is consciousness a marker that we might want to pay attention to a little bit more, or the ability to collaborate, <laughs> right? The ability to join with others is that something that we need to look into, right? This this framing of of, of us as the end all be all is this false notion of progress. Right, and it's this misunderstanding of evolution, right? Um, that we are the pinnacle of evolution. No, we're not the pinnacle of evolution. We are a point, <laughs> right now, right? That could have gone a thousand and one different ways, and actually is going about fifty different ways right now. We are, we are. I mean, I think this is where the theological humbleness really comes into play, right? Like we are, we are a speck on an ongoing stream but we are not like the end all be all. However, when you look at the ways in which technology, uh, material technologies are being utilized now, right? Developing all of these resources for the benefit of, of the human, right? Um, extracting all of these resources that can't be replenished, right? For the benefit of the self-driving car. Well, self-driving car is great. That's awesome. That's amazing. Cool. At most, it's going to impact a fraction of human beings, and human beings are a fraction of the living creatures on this planet. So how much sense does it make to take these non-renewable resources? I mean, like, it's great. Oh, yay, self-driving cars. But, like, what does that really mean? Like, we're kind of we're kind of jacking ourselves over. And, you know, like I've seen like uh, Bezos and the, and the, the rocket ships, right? No, oh, they got in outer space. Well, they did it inefficiently. They did it for a really short amount of time. And very few people were able to, to get the benefits of it. So it's akin to shooting a toilet bowl into the stratosphere and saying, oh, look, we got a toilet bowl out there. Yay, now we're coming back down. Isn't that amazing? Look what we did. I didn't do that. How many resources, how much resources were taken up for that? Is that the best use of the limited resources that we have on the planet? So much of science fiction, those, those guys that um, Dr. Williams was talking, sorry, Dr. Coleman was talking about earlier, um, Asimov, um, all, those, all those guys back in the day, it was all predicated on infinite resources, right? That was the thought that they had. America, we're never going to stop growing. But we know better now. <laughs> so now that we have that scientific reality in front of us, now how does that shape our narratives? I think that's a far more interesting story. Sam, anything to add to this round? Well, I would just push the, I would push the definitions a bit harder, in fact, and, and think about what we collectively might think of as human as being based in a very much Western like enlightenment sort of idea of what it means to be human and what are the rights uh, um, uh, in terms of the natural world thereof. Um, in a Buddhist context, for example, I don't know that we would always privilege the idea of being human vis-a-vis -vis other types of beings 
Um, and uh, that's you know something that I come up against when we discuss, um, let's say, laws for uh, abuse of humans versus abuse of animals, and that there's a differing you know uh, uh, um, differing penalties for like abusing a, an animal than there is for you know um, uh, hurting a human being. Now, I don't know. I don't know how I feel about that. Uh, I, I can say that as a, as a person who self-identifies as, as being multi-religious and part of that multi-religious identity as being Buddhist, um, I find it very difficult to, to think of um, the privileging of humans vis-a-vis -vis other animals uh, or other beings in general. Um, and for us to say, like, what does it mean to be human? Um, you know, I think it's it's a good question to ask, and we have to you know go about our business and and uh, and develop laws and uh, come up with social systems that support that. But sometimes the privileging of the human or the idea of human is at the expense of everything else, and that certainly is um, is worth looking at. Thank you. And now the fi the final uh, question, even though we could continue for hours, I think with this great group is uh, the pandemic has accelerated our shift towards living and working in cyberspace. What are your hope and fears for the emerging new normal? We all want to shake our heads and laugh and cry at the same time, right? Um, I mean, I guess I'll, I'll give a couple comments. And we spent a lot of time talking about this actually on the Octavia Tribe series. Um, you know, we, we are wrapping it up, not because we're not in a pandemic, but because we're tired, right? And, and this was a, a gift to, to the community, um, not a job. And so um, I do, I guess I wanna talk about community. I think that's a big part of what we see in, um, in Afrofuturist kinds of science fiction. And so I think in many ways, it's helping us to find new ways of forming community. Right, and some very creative ways of being global community, right? So, um, and, you know, harnessing social media for community. And I think that's a great new normal. I know I feel stronger connections with some of um, people I've met in Facebook groups, right? Or people, you know, and actually Zoom with and feel like I know because we share, um, you know, distinct commonalities and really do form community around each other. Um, people who I've never met in real life, right? Um, so I think that there are, that is very encouraging about a new normal. And I think that will stay, right? <laughs> Where there have been formations of genuine forms of community. Um, I think it also pushed us to feel how much we need community for those of us who felt, who were very isolated for a variety of reasons and to point out the shortcomings of online community. There are things you cannot do <laughs> in online community. And I think we've experienced that as well. Um, and uh, we talk about a lot in the Octavia Tried series, you talk about grief a lot. And so I think a big part of our new normal isn't just grief, although it is because there's so much loss associated with both living in a pandemic and the actual loss of people because of the pandemic, right? Um, that, is, that is ongoing and not just the loss of life, but the loss of vitality, uh, long COVID anyone, right? <laughs> um, illness, those kinds of things that will stay with us for a long time, right? The kind of um, mental health effects experienced from the pandemic, I think, I hope, I'll say, I can't say I think, but I hope would push us into greater grace for ourselves and for each other to greater resources, which I have seen in terms of all the things that health insurance companies swore could not be done online are now being covered online, right? Um, which is a benefit for many people in terms of access, um, particularly those who live with disabilities and disabling conditions. Um, and to still find way in, and to still grind into the ways in which we need to be in person, right? To do to think about the ways that, which I think is what pushes many people to want to break out, right, and get back to new normal, but it's the old normal. But to be aware of what we can't do online, right? We can't sit with each other online. We can't do community around the food table, right, online. Um, Right, we cannot do rituals of grief <laughs> um, the same way, and in probably some of the most meaningful ways for people online. Right, those are some of our, our limitations. Um, we, if you're if you're speaking religiously, if your form of worship involves things like dance and singing, 
that is horrible on Zoom. Have you tried it, right? Like you can't sync it, right? <laughs> um, so there are, I think it's, it's reminding us of ways in which physical presence is very key while also pushing us to be creative about not just the ways we form community, but the ways in which we are going to live forward, right? And how we adapt. So I think my biggest thing is that I hope that it is generating within all of us um, greater abilities to adapt, right? <laughs> and as as um, Butler says, adapt or die. So when, when adapting, kicking and screaming, right? <laughs> Particularly religious communities were like, oh my God, we have to adapt overnight. It's never been done before. Of course it had been done before. You just hadn't done it before, right? Um, so, but they're like, oh my gosh, if I don't adapt, I'll die. Yes, right? Um, and so I think that it will push us more into being more flexible, right? Into exercising our ability to change right? Um, whether even when change is hard or even when change is lost, to be able to manage change, I hope, in better ways than we have in the past. Thank you so much, Dr. Coleman. Aiza and Song, any few final words on that question? Um, just a, a quick thought. Uh, about embodied religion and what does it mean to embody a tradition online and uh, you know some questions that I ask uh, my media classes for example are um, you know if we do prayer online together in, in community is that is that real prayer or if we take communion online is that real communion if someone puts a GoPro on and does the Hajj pilgrimage in Mecca and we follow along with that is that real Hajj or the the real kicker is if if, uh, the question that I ask when we think about Second Life or World of Warcraft or all other online communities, if two people get married online, is that real marriage? And then we feel a certain way, like maybe yes, maybe no, or not really, or whatever. But then we ask the question, is infidelity online real? And then we go like wait, more like 90% saying like, wait a second, that feels pretty real. What does it mean to embody traditions or actions or things online? And, and um that's, uh, that's definitely where my head is at right now. <clears throat> I mean, I gotta have to acknowledge my privilege in that I've, um, I am living in this pandemic, um, housed, uh, fed, um, sheltered, uh, with access to a laptop <laughs> that works, um, and that I've been able to do my work relatively uninterrupted. Um, so as a result, I cannot speak to the global impacts of this pandemic, right? I'm, I'm coming from an extremely privileged place. Um, that being said, some of the people that I, that I work with as a therapist, you know, actually had someone come in and, um, you know, talk about sort of a, um, a hyper empathy that they started feeling um, in the pandemic. And one of the things, you know, my second degree is in clinical psychology after it's striking. One of the things that, I, that I've, that I noticed is, you know, that we learned is that hyper empathy can also be a, a product of abuse, right? And so I'm seeing these, these emo, you know, people displaying these, these symptoms of abuse in this pandemic and it's not an individual but it's rather this is what happens when people are cut off from other people cut off from touch cut off from non-mediated sound right um and so how do we as a theologian as 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 a minister how do we give care um to folks who you know maybe be able you know maybe in the same privileged position but still they're missing something that, that was taken for granted before. Um, I don't have an answer for that one. Um, I know that I'm working on that. I know that I'm working on it for myself. I know that I'm working on it for my loved ones. Um, I think what we're gonna see, like, you know, and, and I used to work in high schools. And so watching um, teenagers uh, go through this, um, to have this pandemic happen during a, a crucial developmental time for some folks, it's going to be really interesting to see the adults that come out of this pandemic. Um, and I think there's going to have to be a lot of grace and there's going to be a lot of change, right? Change or die. Um, 
there's going to be a lot of change that's going to be necessary um, in this in this culture. I, I'm already feeling this desire to go back to normal, right? Like to, to, to just to bring it back. And it's like if that's not happening, that's like that's not the way. I mean, it's, it's not me saying that. Like that's just not the way that the world works. Like we keep moving forward. So what is that change going to look like? Um, I think that's interesting. And I think the more compassion and the more care that we have for each other um, and for the people that we're serving, the better off everybody's gonna be. Well, regrettably, it's time to close this particular conversation. We'll start other soon in the small groups. I am so deeply thankful for all the, you know, the words and, and thoughts uh, ideas expressed by the panelists. Thank you so much, all of you. This was really wonderfully engaging and thought provoking and nourishing, I think. I think I can speak for, for all. So thank you so much. Dr. Coleman, it was beautiful to have you here. I hope to see you back soon as Esther King. Um, we love you and your work. Thank you so much, Isa, wonderful colleagues. And thank you everyone that, uh, has been listening with care and depth. Thank you.